everyone. It's great to welcome. It's great to have you all here. I have a hunch numbers keep growing, which is fantastic. We're going to need a bigger room. We're going to need a bigger room. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, so if you haven't been before, welcome. It's it's great to have you here. I'm, my name's Vince. Um, that's Mark over there, and there are various other people who who help with organizing um, this weekly. Sorry, monthly. I don't panic. <laughs> 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 One main talk this evening, and then after that, the floor is kind of open if you'd like to give uh, lightning talks. And then the plan is after that to go <coughs> to go to the pub um, to chat. So uh, it'd be great to get to know everyone. So the, the main speaker of this evening is, is David, um, who a few of us were lucky enough to hear speak at PyCon, which took place. Uh, pardon me. <coughs> in as my dessert stuck in my throat. Um, Partly, uh, we, we, we heard his uh, lightning talk at PyCon, which was really fantastic, and so we asked him if he could give us a slightly longer version of it. So let's, uh, let's all welcome David. So I'm uh, David. Uh, I guess I've been around a while, probably 15, 20 years in the IT business. Um, and uh, I'd like to tell you a little bit about uh, some of the work we're doing at ONS, so the Office for National Statistics. Um, so I kind of like to say I sort of stood on the shoulders of giants, um, kind of walked into a perfect storm, a, a really good situation, um, and we're very fortunate to do something um, that certainly I think is pretty cool. Um, statistics isn't always the most exciting thing, but um, I think we've actually managed to build something quite interesting. So um, just a few disclaimers to start with. Um, I haven't really asked anyone whether I can do this. They've all generally given me the nod. So. If anyone's watching online or if anyone gets offended, do come and talk to me. No offence intended. So, and do take me with a pinch of salt because I'll, I'll hand this up a bit if I can. So, um, slightly existential for Tuesday night. Um, but maybe just to give you a little bit of an idea of kind of where I've come from, I kind of started out somewhere in Portsmouth and have ended up somewhere in Newport. Um, so that probably tells you something about my life. Um, I've probably been programming since I was five or six, and that probably tells you something about my parents. So, um, hey, who, who wouldn't want to be me? So, uh, let's talk about ONS instead. So, um, ONS is the UK's largest producer of, of official statistics. There are statistics all over government, but ONS is kind of the biggie. Um, they are naturally a very risk-averse organisation. They have to keep their statistics consistent. Um, people like government make policy decisions on it. Um, people like banks make decisions about what they're going to trade and what they're going to set their interest rates at um, based on what the ONS does. So if the stats suddenly kind of jump around or change, that's really quite a big deal for the country. So we're, we're kind of talking about a piece of national infrastructure um, and somebody asked me to build them a new website and I thought, okay, <laughs> um, I'm sure it'll be fine. So um, I'll just skip back one, if I can. The, um, yeah, so the little chap at the top here. So I'd, I'd done a, a bit of startup, um, did that for two or three years, took everything I learned in the startup, and then said, well, why doesn't government just think a bit more like a startup? Because that would work, right? Um, it is a good idea. <laughs> um, so ONS, ONS was actually having a pretty hard time when I arrived. So the, their website was pretty dire. Um, it was getting column inches in the FT just to slag them off. Um, there were people kind of about to lose their jobs over it um, or who had offered to lose their jobs over it. Um, and really it came down to this kind of combination of um, quite an unpleasant 90s website, every single possible technical decision being made wrong. Um, that's a quote from someone who told that to me. That's not my opinion. Um, and, and really, you, you couldn't navigate it. You couldn't find anything. The search was terrible. There was just stuff all over the place. Um, so they just really wanted to kind of turn this thing around and kind of try and come into the modern age with it. So fortunately for me, this happened. So um, has anyone heard of the Government Digital Service? Might be one or two. So these, this is basically um, a bunch of lunatics, um, really good lunatics, who went into government and said, you know what, you guys have been doing IT projects for a long time. 
and trying harder to do the wrong thing better isn't going to help you. So why don't you borrow some thinking from startups? Why don't you do some agile development? Why don't you actually start to change the culture and kind of the exam question that is set for projects in government so that you guys can actually deliver something? Because you know what? There are some good people in government who'd like to do good things, but they're all stuck in these projects. They're in waterfall plans. They're just kind of stuck in these situations where it's almost impossible to deliver. So GDS kind of came along and said, you know what, you guys, you could deliver if we can just persuade you to behave a little bit differently. So fortunately for me, I was kind of walking into a situation where this had already happened. Um, so me walking in with my little startup hat on saying, you know what, we should be agile. And they kind of went, yeah, we should. And I'm like, OK, great, we can work together. Uh, the other thing that's happened really, um, when the last website was built, none of this kind of stuff existed. So the, um, the amount by which technology has changed even in just the last five years makes so much possible that you just couldn't do before. Um, so I think the, there's kind of a combination there of kind of culture and technology. Um, I'm trying to give you this picture of a, a kind of a perfect storm that made this possible. So let's talk about iterating. So as in, is anyone kind of familiar with Agile? Just kind of checking, does that make sense if I say Agile? Um, so this is the idea that um, I guess your traditional government IT project spends £100 million making a five-year plan, promptly then either doesn't deliver or delivers the wrong thing but ticks off the plan and nobody's happy. So the idea of kind of iterating, building prototypes, starting small, moving quickly was quite alien um, in government circles maybe five years ago. So we kind of took this thing to heart and thought, right, so here's ONS in 2014. So I'm going to show you the original website. This is still available on the National Archives, and it's, it's worth a visit if you want to see something a little bit scary. So what you see here is words, a lot of words, no data, no numbers. The bit that you're probably interested in is around about there, a tiny little piece of the website, just not, not a happy user experience. If you are a user of statistics, you want to go to a website, you want to get some numbers, you want to find out what's going on. You really don't want to have to walk through some kind of wiki. So we came along and did a, a nice little alpha prototype. So we thought, okay, let's take three months. Let's let, you know, let's kind of iterate some ideas. They'd already done quite a lot of user research, quite a lot of information architecture, a lot of thinking about um, how could you kind of take apart that website and put it back together and try and put the data at the center. So this is really about thinking, okay, what do our users want? What do they need? I mean, it sounds trivial to say it now, but Nobody thought about this stuff before. They, somebody sat in a room and said, you know what, we're going to build a system. I think people should have this. Instead of that, we went out and found out what people actually wanted and started building that for them. So we started here in about September 2014. This took about two weeks to build. Um, just to give you a scale of that, government is used to the idea that it takes six months to buy a server, to put it in a cellar, to rack it up, to send a man down there with a CD, with some software, probably Oracle, in about six months. When they finally turned it on, they'll start thinking about writing some code. We put this thing up on Heroku in two weeks, and they just kind of went, oh, you can do that? And, and I was like, well, of course you can do that. That's how you run a startup. Um, but that's not how you typically run government. And um, so <laughs> Uh, this, this stuff is still there on Heroku, so the, there are some links in the presentation, if I, I might share it later, but um, you, can actually, you can actually get to these things, they're still running. So a um, couple of weeks later, we moved it onto this, so um, we might notice here we've got kind of these boxes of numbers. That was kind of cool, but we thought, actually, let's, you know, let's put the headline numbers right kind of front and centre there. So you come in, you can instantly see the main things that ONS does, so it's about the economy, it's about society, and um, somewhere in the background is also the census. So they do the UK census, which is coming up in 2021. Um, I believe the favourite phrase for the, certainly for the society bit, they call it hatches, matches, and dispatches, births, deaths, and marriages. So moved on again from here, another couple of weeks, uh, if I can click my mouse. So now the, we went out and tested that website and everybody said, you know, you know what, we love these numbers, it's really great, but we don't, we can't see the context. You know, if, I don't know, if inflation is 1.2%, what was it last month? How's it going? So they said, we need context. So we started putting in these spark lines. 
And so then the users started going, this is really cool, because you know what? Inflation is 1.2%, but I can see that it was higher. I can see where it's going. I can see the trend. So every time we put some new stuff up, um, the guys would go out to London. They would dig up whoever they could find. They'd go talk to the FT. They'd talk to BBC. They'd go down to the House of Commons. They're, the thing about the stats world is people are incredibly passionate about stats because these poor people have to do this stuff all day for work. And if they can't get the numbers, they can't do their jobs and they get really obsessed about it. But at the same time, they're just so willing to participate. And when we started showing them this stuff, they were all over it. And so everything from government to finance to media to civil society, they were all just, just champing at the bit to see this stuff happen. So we moved on again. And we added sort of a few kind of nice colors. And we said, right, that's, that's our alpha. So we put that out there in the public domain. Um, now, it may not be obvious, but government projects usually go on in a cellar for five years. And then they have a big launch, and it fails, and it doesn't work. Um, and everybody goes, oh, that's a shame. <laughs> uh, <laughs> yeah, so don't quote me too literally. But that's perhaps been my experience of government IT projects that I've worked on in the past. Um, and here we were, we were putting this stuff on GitHub, so even the code was in the open. Anyone could go and pick over our code. Anyone could come onto this prototype. Anyone could see what the ONS was doing. And they you know, started kind of in the statistical world, but it was all over Twitter. People were just going, oh my goodness, this is brilliant. They're finally doing something good. Um, and you know, which sounds a bit harsh, but actually it was really exciting. You know, the organization had never really done something good with IT that the, you know, the public was interested in that, that was actually going to maybe make a difference. Um, so alpha went down really well, so we thought, right, let's go for a beta phase, let's take it to the next step. So 2015, um, so this, the, now this is for real, right, we're not, we're not just building toys anymore, we actually have to, this thing has to be secure, it has to run, it has to publish stuff, it has to work. Um, skipping forward a bit, I think the guys reckon they've, there's another team taking it on now, but they've had 100% uptime since the thing went live. That is just unheard of for any kind of technology that ONS did before. Uh, I think the previous website fell over on the first day. So it kind of gives you an idea of quite how, how quickly we were moving here. So this is what we kind of built pretty much over the course of a year. Um, looks a little bit different, slightly different layout, but a lot of the same stuff is still here. Um, Matt Jukes, the guy who... Um, was running the project demanded that we have this up here. So this is the one thing that wasn't really based on user research, but it was an idea. Um, I believe the team are trying to kind of move it down the page now and <laughs> make it go. Still, everyone's allowed one conceit. Um, so yeah, so we had to get kind of the whole infrastructure in place. So this, this couldn't really run on Heroku anymore. We had to get it into, we did, it did actually end up in AWS, which was really nice. Um, I did a bunch of cryptography, which is one of my favorite things, uh, because some of this, so things like inflation figures, if the banks get this five minutes early, they'll make a lot of money. So you've got to keep this stuff incredibly secret, and then the moment you publish it, within 60 seconds, it's open data. So there's a, there's a really interesting kind of security curve in the way that information gets released. And so we kind of came to the end of beta, and so in about February, we released the live website. So this, if you open up ons.gov.uk, you'll see this. Um, I like to call it my baby. It isn't really my baby anymore. Um, kind of passed it on to its new parents. Um, the, I guess what, what you can see, the, the previous website, I believe, had about 5,000 nodes of navigation in that left-hand menu down here, which might <laughs> not surprise you, or it might surprise you, depending on what you know. So now we've just got kind of some very simple stuff at the top. I think it's, we're down to about 130, 150, um, even once you've gone right down to the bottom. So it's a massive collapsing of um, the number of places you can go and get lost on the website. Um, the search now works, which is great. So that's um, elastic search in the background. Um, and the old search used to return you 10,000 results that all look the same, um, whereas now you can actually find what you're looking for, which is quite cool. So we slipped in a few clever features. So each of these time series, as they're called, have got like a four letter code. Um, and if you type that into the search box, as the professionals will, it'll take them straight to the numbers they're looking for, which they could never do before. So a lot of kind of quite clever stuff going on in the background that you know, has really made this work for the people that have to use it day in, day out. Um, I just think that's really cool because I love building the tech, but I love the fact that we, you know, within the whole team, we have the people who could go out to talk to you know, 
the data journalists at the BBC and say, what do you guys need? And then bring that back and then the team could build it. So, you know, really nice kind of sense of feedback and constantly iterating on that. So, I'm going to call myself out, you know, other good websites have been built. Okay, and you know, and it's not easy. You know, it's quite an achievement in itself. But but there's more to this, um, and I think this is where it gets kind of really quite special. And it's all about this. So that website is not a website; it's an API. What you see when you go to the website is a browser-based app that lands in your browser and starts talking to the API. So as you're browsing around, what you're actually looking at is is the real data. So if you put, if you go to any URL on the ONS website and put slash data on the end just for fun, you'll get JSON. Um, and this is really cool because not a lot of people are really doing open data. You know, more and more people are doing it. But the question is, who's going to do it first? And why, why are they going to do it? What are they going to do it for? Who's going to fund the project? What's the benefit going to be? Nobody's kind of moving on this stuff. So people have to start growing a pair and getting it out there. And you know, credit to ONS that, that they did that first. So it looks a little something like this. And I just think that's cool. And I feel a bit like that about it. <laughs> so um, if, you, yeah, if you stick slash data on the end, you'll get all the JSON. So it, um, it's to be clear, most of the JSON, that is the JSON that backs up the page that you see. So if you actually drill right down to the time series, you can get the actual data behind those graphs. So if we move on. So if you get to a page that looks a bit like this, and then you drill in behind that, you'll get the entire time series of information. And that's really cool, because if you're analyzing anything or you want to look back over how the UK's performed over the last what, 50 years or so, you can actually computationally get hold of that. Um, and it's all totally open, so there's you know, literally no limits on it. So I thought I'd talk a little bit about architecture, because a lot of this is about you know, how you put the system together behind the scenes. Um, some of you may or may not have seen things like this. That makes me feel like that. <laughs> I just no. So um, I'm kind of more into this. So um, if you strip it back from technology and just think about design thinking, if you're going to design something that's really good, you really have to kind of take away everything you possibly can. You have to drill it back to the simplest possible kind of minimum that really um, hits the kind of thing you want to do. So whether you're whether you're kind of visual designer, user experience designer, whether you're trying to find out what users want, or whether you're designing the the kit behind it, all of it comes back to that kind of design thinking. So a um, couple of my favourite. I sort of raided my Twitter history for some of my kind of favourite quotes I've picked up from different people. Um, but you know, the, there's a discipline to this stuff. It, it's hard. Um, I often say that. You can start simplistic, and then you'll get complex. And only once you've taken stuff away from that and gone a little bit further, that's where you get to simple. And simple is really hard work. And you'll often feel embarrassed if you do something simple, because you put it in front of someone, and you think they're going to say, is that it? Um, but as we all know, you look at a MacBook, and you think, no. That might not have a lot of bells and whistles, but you know, that's had some thought gone into it. So I'm kind of all about do less. So this is one of my favorite objects. Um, my mother, randomly, was working in Afghanistan for a couple of years. Um, they had no power out there. Um, she loved to have orange juice in the morning. She could get oranges, but she didn't have an electric orange squeezer. So I sent her one of these for Christmas. Um, I don't know why it didn't get stopped by the police or something. But um, sadly, it doesn't really work. But it's a really great idea, because it's, it's an iconic piece of design. It's incredibly simple, and it requires no power. And theoretically, the juice flows down, and you get your orange juice in the morning. Um, so notwithstanding that it isn't perfect, um, that's kind of how I like to think. Excuse me, you mean you put the glass underneath the... <coughs> yes, and it, it flows down the, the bulb, yeah. So I'm all about this idea that you know, simple is really hard. To actually make something simple takes a lot of thought. Um, I'm a fan of saying that if, if anyone's seen Taken, Complexity will find you, and it will kill you. Um, so you know, start simple, but you'll see things creep in, and you're going to have to take them out. You know, if you're writing code, you're going to have to refactor it. You have to pull it out. You're going to have to kill your darlings. You're going to have to get rid of good stuff to just get down to the great stuff. 
Um, so we did this kind of with a, um, microservices. Anyone, does microservices mean something to everyone? So this is the idea that instead of building one big system, you break it up into smaller pieces. Um, there's no magic about it. Um, a lot of people get very excited about it. It's just another way of partitioning your complexity. So, but there are good reasons to use it, and we, we decided to do a bit of it for this. So that's your traditional system, one massive piece of code, and your user notification component over here could be fiddling with your user accounts over here. You know, the code's all mixed up together. There's no kind of partitioning. Some people will go the other way, so they'll talk about very fine-grained microservices. This is almost exposing every table in your database as a REST service, um, and suddenly you have to worry about distributed transactions across multiple HTTP endpoints. Not, not terribly helpful. So what you're looking for probably um, is kind of a Goldilocks situation. So you're looking to kind of partition your complexity, but kind of do one job in one place, and make sure that you know there's there's a sensible division of this bit over here deals with user profiles, this bit over here deals with permissions, that bit over there deals with handling content. Each of those things should be kind of a, a kind of a job to be done in its own right. And that it's really a judgment call. It's kind of you know what makes sense um, for what you're building. But what you find is that HTTP becomes the common language. You've got really nice separation in your code. You can really focus on one thing. You've reduced your complexity. And if complexity is exponential, then you know, your life's going to get a lot easier, even if you just kind of halve or quarter the size of each chunk that you're building. So I put Florence up there because Matt Jukes um, very sensibly, very soberly came up with a, a theme for the project, uh, which was around Florence Nightingale, because she's kind of famously one of the first statisticians. She's actually the first person to use to graphically present statistics. So she's kind of the lady behind pie charts, which is ironic because ONS think pie charts are not statistics. Putting that aside, um, so this was kind of the theme for the whole project, and it was all going to be very sober. But if any of you remember the 70s cartoon, The Magic Roundabout, we pretty quickly got rid of the idea of Florence Nightingale. And this lady over here is also called Florence. Um, if you haven't seen it, it's worth looking up on YouTube. It's a massive drug fuel cluster of a thing. but absolutely charming. So what, what we actually did, that I'm putting this up here to kind of reflect the idea of not too many microservices. So we ended up with about as many microservices as there are magic roundabout characters. And every time we ran out of characters, we realized we'd gone too far and we had to get rid of something. Um, and every time we had one spare, we started thinking about what the next thing was we could build. So, but it, it kind of, it gave us a quite a nice way of sort of saying that's about the right size, that's about our Goldilocks size for the thing that we're building. Um, so I think you know, we've got kind of data publishing down here. We've got um, testing framework up there. Um, this was the content edit editing application. This was the, the thing that actually did the content management in the back end. Um, Dougal here was going to represent the website, but we kind of ran out of time for that. Um, so kind of, and oh, in fact, this, this guy was the data pipeline, if anyone's into kind of data science. If, I think if you look up Brian on ONS Digital, he's still there, and you can go and dig into the code. Um, so where I'm being a little bit cheeky is actually all of these things are written in Java, um, but what we've gone on to do next, ONS is all done in Python, so Ian here is working with me. Um, and actually Ian was the one who kind of turned it all around into Python. Um, we started writing some stuff in Java, and Ian said, look, it's about this big in Python, it's about this big in Java, what do you think we should do? So there's kind of a, I've now got the fight on my hands that I need to persuade the rest of ONS that Python's the right thing to do, and not everyone's happy about that. Um, but we're making good headway. So I guess the, the next thing I wanted to talk about is people. So all the tech in the world isn't going to make a great project necessarily. Um, it's, it's kind of random. And I guess what I've learned over the last 10 years, I've been kind of experimenting, tinkering, making bigger and bigger bets, is that the idea that if you can create the right environment for a team, if you get the connections right between people, if you just think about it in the right way, the kind of energy and kind of momentum that you can create in a team that's doing actually something quite big and scary um, is really incredible. Um, I have no figures to back this up, but I think what you can do if you get the people right is about an order of magnitude bigger and more powerful than what you could do if you don't. And I've seen the flip side of that. So I worked on projects where people haven't worked at all, where there's been bad relationships. It just 
you know, if you've ever worked in a team where you're not getting on, you know that you can't get anything done. If you've ever worked in a team where it's just clicking, you know, my goodness, nobody can stop you. So the, uh, these are just kind of some of my uh, influences. Probably the most famous is, is this guy, um, 37 Signals, who wrote Basecamp. Um, quite a few people have heard of Rework. Um, this one is ages old. I don't think you can even get it in print anymore. Um, but that's the thing that kind of got me thinking, hang on a minute, people, people. People is a hard problem of technology. Um, and up at this end, you've got um, something called Project Aristotle. So this is something that Google did, where they identified kind of five or six factors that really predict high-performing teams. And their number one thing is psychological safety. And that's a really interesting concept. So if you're in a group of people and you don't feel safe, or you feel they're going to undermine you, you're just not going to contribute. You'll shut down, you'll close out, you won't get involved. But when you're in a group where you feel that everyone's got your back, where you feel that everyone's pulling together, suddenly, gosh, you know, huge release, everyone's engaged, you know, everyone's just kind of pouring out their ideas. It's all kind of mashing up together and something, something absolutely magical happens. So I'm hugely into this stuff. So although I do tech all the time, I talk about technology, I'm kind of about the people, but you can't always kind of bring that to the surface when actually all you've got to do is deliver a website. So um, leadership, dreadful word, hate it, but turn it around a little bit, think of it differently, right? If, if you at some point end up leading a team, if you're in charge of something, be a facilitator, be the person that makes it okay for everyone else to be there, be the person that makes everyone think, you know what, it's okay to be me, it's okay to contribute. Create that atmosphere, get the blockers out of the way, deal with bad values, you know, when you've, um, I'm fond of saying that, um, Ego puts the poo in pool party, right? Everyone's in the pool, everyone's having a great time. Whoa, there's a, everyone's out. No, one, no one's going to go swimming anymore, right? So kill the ego. Where you find an ego, get rid of it, get around it, get away from it, because you won't get anything done whilst that thing's floating around. And if anyone's ever had that experience or can think back to a team where you've had someone with a, a really brittle or prickly or defensive personality, you can't get anything done. You've, you know, you've got to deal with it. Um, so I think there's something about really bringing that to the fore and sort of understanding that, um, so there's a couple of, I call this the cheese sandwich, um, kind of cheesy quotes, but they are, you know, they capture something. Um, so I've just lost my train of thought. Let's go in here. So this, this was actually something, randomly I found myself tweeting the head of Bernardo's, I think he is, um, and they just put up some team principles uh, on Twitter and I thought these were brilliant. So I tweeted him back and said, love your principles, think they're great, you know, make sure people stick to them. And he said, why? You know, how would you do it? How would you make sure that, that we stick to our team principles? And, and I tweeted this back, which he thought was quite cool. Um, the one I love here is the word vulnerability. So has anyone heard of Brene Brown? Probably not. So she's, she's got a couple of very famous TED Talks. Um, it's quite an uncomfortable word. It's not something that people are used to talking about. But if you think of the idea that you've got an ego in a situation, they're probably scared of something and they're holding back and they're clinging on to something. And that fear is kind of, you know, no one, it's just not having the courage to kind of put yourself out there and go, you know what, that's me, here I am. So it takes a certain level of vulnerability to go into a situation and go, you know what, this is what I think, this is who I am, to, you know, to encourage everyone else to do the same and start to create that atmosphere that allows you to get good work done. Um, so. I particularly wanted to put that in there because um, not something that people often think about. And if you do fancy looking up Brene Brown, it's quite a confusing TED talk, but once you've watched it two or three times, something kind of starts to percolate and, and there's, there's something really clever in there. Um, I'll skip that one, but um, there was something. Oops, sorry. This, this is probably my favorite one. I, I thought I'd make this up and then I found someone else who'd already made it up. Um, one of the best things about working on a good team is you can just argue the whole time. So I spent most of my time at the startup arguing. I spent most of the time at ONS arguing. But arguing about what was right, we were all into like, we're gonna make this thing. You know, it's not my idea, it's not your idea, it's not us kind of fighting each other. We're all thinking about the thing that we wanna build. Um, Again, that's one way you can kind of see, you know, you can judge a situation. If, if people are starting to argue about who's right, you know you've got a problem and you know you're probably not going to get any work done. But if you can turn it around to that, 
then you're going to get moving again. By the way, how am I doing for time? I've got no idea. Yeah, cool. Um, so I'm going backwards. So I kind of wanted to sort of distill some of it out. I mean, they're, they're just they're very kind of soundbitey bullet points, but these are the, some of the things that I kind of live and die by. Um, I guess something we haven't really talked on is the, this idea of kind of autonomy. So there's a guy called Dan Pink who's written a book called Drive, and he talks about autonomy, mastery, and purpose. Um, something I think the civil service could really get right because most people who work for the civil service have a real sense of purpose. And actually, the civil service is quite good at training. So you know, people can get very good at what they do, so you can get a sense of mastery. But there, I think it's fair to say most people would say there's not a lot of autonomy. There's a lot of structures, a lot of process. And I have a theory that if the civil service could just give people autonomy, you'd have people banging on the door to get in because it would be a really, really awesome place to work. Um, just a theory. I'll leave that there. So um, the other thing I wanted to touch on is digital. So this is a word that gets really, really badly misused. Um, so I mentioned the government digital service earlier. People talk about digital services, digital technology. You know, is this about websites? Is it is it about web design? What you know, what does that actually mean? So skipping the obvious dictionary definition. Um, in government, digital is generally used to mean agile projects or you know doing things better. Um, I think it goes deeper than that. I think that if the industrial revolution released value by automating physical processes, the digital revolution is about releasing value by automating information processes, and that's why you get companies like uh, cheesy to say it, but but your your Ubers of the world, your Airbnbs of the world, they are people who've created platforms where information can be exchanged, where people can make deals effectively by exchanging that information. So perhaps in the 90s people started doing websites because that was one way of kind of getting information out there to customers. Then it moved to these kind of platforms. The I think the um, I guess your, your internet shopping, okay, I, I want some products, you've got information about products, let's put that information together, transaction happens, boom, value. So um, if you ever hear people talking about digital this, digital that, think back to this idea of information automation, because um, I, I think there's something very powerful in that about being able to actually describe what's happening to the world, what's been happening for the last 10 years, what is going to carry on happening. Maybe why, maybe even why Trump got in, right? You know, if, if there's a whole kind of section of society that's kind of floated off on this digital nirvana and everyone else got left behind, you know, you don't hear those people on Twitter and maybe that's why they all voted for Trump. Don't know. So this, the kind of the fun part, you know, we did this, we delivered it kind of against the odds, really lucky to walk into a perfect storm, had an amazing team, just you know, everything seemed to be kind of going for us. And it's not that it wasn't hard. I mean, the, I often say the best of times and the worst of times come together. And you know, there were definitely ups and downs to this thing. And there were days when we didn't want to really do it. But there's something about the power of that team that kind of kept us all together and kept us on that vision. So this was pretty cool. Um, so this was kind of the reaction on Twitter when this thing went out. Um, I think somebody said, ONS is already better than all of gov.uk. Which I was like, wow, I'm, I'm not going to walk into that argument, but you know, what a compliment. Um, we got some pretty good stuff. So we, we actually got to go to the St. David's Awards, which was really quite nice. We didn't actually win, but um, we got all the way to the final. A um, couple of the team got invited to go down and see the Queen. So this was the, uh, the Civil Service Awards finals. Um, and Matthew Hancock up here said some, some very nice things about us. And specifically, this. So what, what I love about this is it, you know, the I'm trying to remember how much the previous project cost. I don't know, but it'll be in the tens of millions. And we are talking literally an order of magnitude less money spent to build something that's possibly an order of magnitude better than the thing that went before. So there's something incredibly powerful about what you can do with all this technology with, you know, the the mandate in government to go and do good work um, and with a really good team and the right situation. So I'm going to say thank you to um, a whole bunch of people, but um, these really were the guys who made it happen. So you know, 
Um, Laura was kind of our, our senior person. Without her, she was the one kind of clearing the space, making sure that everyone stayed out of the way of the team and just kind of fighting the good fight for anyone asking questions. She just said, it's fine, we've got it under control. I trust Matt. And Matt and I were working quite closely together to do this. And Julie really was the one that just, you know, she churned through it, she made it happen. You, you should have seen that. That woman has the best phone skills I've ever seen. You know, if I could do what she did on the phone, I would be a, you know, a far richer man than I am. Um, she is absolutely brilliant. She's, so Matt's actually gone off to work for DEFRA. Julie's now working for what's now the recruitment platform for government or civil service jobs. Um, and Laura's still fighting the good fight at ONS. Um, but apart from that, it's really, it's just the people and um, in no particular order, and I couldn't get everyone on there, but you know, there's a lot of people who've come, you know, what's with the egg? Uh, there's a lot of people who've come through. <laughs> <laughs> so actually the, the panda here is now running the ONS website. So he's, this, this is the tech lead. Um, Ian, sorry, I got you embarrassed up there. Um, Andrew's here as well tonight. Um, you know, all of these people, I couldn't get everyone on there, but you know, some of them are ONS, some of them are my people, some of them are you know, my teams, others, contractors who work with us, but everyone who's just kind of come through this story, through the different projects, through the website projects, through what we've done afterwards, we're now trying to digitize data collection because ONS collects most of its data on paper forms and over the telephone. Wouldn't it be nice to get that online? So that's what we're doing now in Python. Um, and just, you know, what a lovely bunch, <laughs> um, mostly. <laughs> um, so I thought I'd just uh, give you a few outtakes. So when, when you kind of take on something of this magnitude that's kind of this scary and this high profile, um, you try and have a little bit of fun with it and you know, get away with a few bits of goodness around the edge. Um, so one of my favorite things is, is this shot here. So this is Fields House in Newport. Um, it was the set for, it, it's, a, it's an actual working home. People live there, it's on Airbnb. If you want to stay there, it's about 380 quid. Um, we discovered that if we packed about five or six of us in there, it was cheaper than staying in a hotel. So we managed to stay in what is essentially about a quarter of the size of Downton Abbey um, for two weeks. Unfortunately, what we only figured out later was that it was less than the cost of the hotel, but then we couldn't afford to eat out. So, um, so I kind of went down to Sainsbury's, got a load of food in and cooked for the guys. Um, but it was just a, just a fantastic experience because most of these guys came up from London and they were a bit like, we're going to Newport, well, you know, wow. Um, so I was like, okay, we, yeah, we're going to have to do something fun. Let's go stay in a mansion for two weeks. Great. Um, great fun. We'd, we got really into mobile Wi-Fi because we were sort of so into coding the stuff that we didn't really want to stop, but we had to go home and we had to eat. So um, we were driving back to Cardiff and quite often the Wi-Fi would be on in the car and you know, two or three of us would be like coding away and just trying to finish that thing that we were really into. And this guy, Bren, awesome, you know, just can't fault him, really good developer. Um, I'll lend him to you if you ever want him. But this, um, this was how we went live with the alpha prototype. So it's me sitting at Reading Station, freezing cold. Um, I just had the message from Matt to say, yes, I'm happy. Let's go live, take the password off, let the public see it. Um, so I got my laptop out and uh, made it happen. And, you know, and how nice that you can just do it halfway home, sitting on the station. That's pretty cool. Then, um, so th this is one of our typical arguments, get all the guys in the room, just kind of go at each other for about two hours until we've kind of got the right idea and then we'll go out and build it. Um, really nice way of figuring out what you're doing. Then just, um, I guess just a bunch of milestones, but the, uh, this was one of Matt's talks and I don't know if you can kind of get the sense from the picture, you know, there's just a real warmth in this team. These, you know, these people really enjoyed working together. I really enjoyed working with them. I'd, you know, I'd do it again any day. Um, and just to be clear, that's a whole mix of you've got ONS people there, you've got my team, you've got other people. It's just, you know, it's a wonderful mix of people who just want to get the job done. Um, so in Beta, we moved out of Newport and into some flats in Cardiff, but again, always slim on expenses budget. So um, myself and another guy, we ended up cooking for the whole team for the whole year. Um, and just to be clear, ONS didn't pay for any of this alcohol. <laughs> um, we actually went out and bought this ourselves, but we kind of we'd get everyone around the table in the evening, and you know everyone would be blowing off steam from the day, and then we'd have a couple of drinks and chill out. And you know, some evenings everyone would roll home, but other evenings we'd end up just talking till 11 o'clock at night, and just a really nice way of kind of letting off steam, spending some more time with the team, just not feeling, I guess, 
if anyone's had the experience of traveling for work, it can be a bit lonely. You're stuck in a hotel room, you've got nothing to do. So we just had the luxury of this nice flat where we could get everyone around and just have a nice dinner together every night. And that, that was a, a lovely way of just kind of improving the experience. Then, so, so this guy, this guy here is the other chef. This guy, I don't know what he's doing because he wasn't on our project. But, um, <laughs> but yeah, so this, this was kind of what we used to get up to in the evenings just to kind of yeah, help, help ourselves along whilst we were kind of a little bit scared about what we were doing. And this was a lovely unexpected bonus um, dinner at the Senate for the um, St. David's Awards. Um, quite a splendid evening. We just got it. We didn't win. We thought we should have done Periscope. What is that? Anyway, and another unexpected bonus. <laughs> um, so I met my uh, girlfriend through this project. So thank you very much. Um, hopefully that's kind of given you some interesting things to chew over and uh, a bit of a bit of story and backstory. We're, we're still working at the ONS, um, chugging away on, on data collection. Um, so I'm always after good people. <laughs>
I think the I think the guys would probably agree that the situation we find ourselves in is that you know there's there's been a real kind of opening up to it, but now there's a learning process, there's a culture change process, there's a you know there's presumably lots of people who are very comfortable doing it how they were doing it before, and who are like I don't know what these hippies doing their agile thing are up to, um, I don't know um, you know I don't know them personally, but I think it is a process. It's uh, you know it's kind of saying look, you can do good stuff. It's not easy. You, know, you have to be simple about it, and that is hard. And and I think it's also about communicating you know, why that's a good idea. Why why should you let go of the plans that you used to have? Because actually, they work really well for a long time. Um, so yeah. So I think the in a sense, uh, you know, there's kind of that spark effect, and then and then it's that long burn to kind of say right, let's actually culturally move the organisation there. Um, and you know, and it, it's moving. You know, there's a lot of people getting there. Um, but yeah, as you say, it, it will take time, and it's a human process. And I think that word forced is probably quite, um, you know, it has to be acknowledged that, you know, this, this has kind of happened in one corner of the organisation, some people kind of run away with it, but, you know, does that create rifts? I, you know, probably it does. How do you, how do you, I guess, heal those rifts, but also how do you then kind of go back and sort of restart the conversation in the wider organisation and kind of get everyone moving together? Um, yeah, it's, uh, it's a cultural challenge. Yeah. Not necessarily, you don't have to be specific to this organisation, mm. but do you think that's something that an organisation should do? Mm. So I guess uh, I'll, I'll go back to my startup because it's slightly safe territory. Um, so what happened there was um, me and another guy started it. We hired one, two more people. We had a really nice technical team. Um, what we found was that at the you know sort of a, at the higher level of the organisation where you've got the kind of you know directors and investors, we found that actually that wasn't working very well. And what happened over the course of three years was actually that was what killed the company was the breakdown in those relationships. Um, so it, it, it is a really, really hard question because you know, you've know you got to deal with it, but do you deal with it by cutting something, cutting someone out effectively, or do you deal with it by kind of just working with that person until you know they feel included and they can kind of start to warm to it? Um, I've seen kind of all spectrums of that and the, you know some people are really, really difficult. Um, and it's very, you know, it's hard to know what what is the humane thing to do, what is the just thing to do, um, and sometimes you just kind of have to make a decision. So, 
Yeah, I, I don't have an answer. Does your experience of our child indicate that the unified modelling language and the similar formalisms um, are no longer useful? Or can they be useful to help you along? Hmm. That's a really interesting question because I've, I've been actually been having that conversation recently. So um, I think for me it's really important that um, I think the principle of just enough is is a uh, is very powerful. So you kind of you know, you'll you'll kind of stop and think for just enough so that you can act, and and then what you build informs your learning. It kind of you know it, it makes it specific and concrete. It puts it into practice, and you it's almost the discipline of building it forces you to think harder so that you can then step back and think again. So I don't know whether I certainly tend not to, but that's so that's maybe because I tend to work in the alpha and beta phases, whereas once you get further down the line and there needs to be more communication across an organization of how the system works so that other people can kind of pick it up and work with it, you know, the I think the the need for documentation kind of matures along with the project. So um, I think it is a useful communication tool if you know if it's a shared language, if people are getting it, it's a good way of talking. But it, it yeah, I would say um, I, w I will tend to just, I've got one of those um, three quid IKEA paper rolls for kids drawing and I'll, I'll open it up, put a couple of paperweights on it and just sketch something and, and you know, I'll, I'll put a few names and labels and boxes and lines and go, right, I think I half understand that. Let me do a couple of hours of coding. Right, that's improved my understanding. Now I can both go back to it. Okay, that's rubbish now. Move on to stuff again. So I think ultimately anything you use has to be about communication. So whether it's you externalizing what you're thinking into a form that you can then do something with, or whether it's you kind of communicating to someone else who needs to know um, how it works, then if it's the right language for that communication, then there's no reason it, it couldn't be useful. I don't know, is, is that another character question? <laughs> yeah. Can we squeeze in two? <laughs> Um, I think technical, so you, you can only really focus on one thing, you can only do one thing well. So we tackled the website, and now that's out there, that, you know, it kind of went out as an MVP, it was, you know, it was just, just enough to persuade the organisation to move over. So now the focus is shifting to some of those other things. So I believe projects are now just kicking off to start tackling some of the other parts around the main website. I think that's the hope. The, the reality is that some of that geographical postcode level data is so complex that to actually get that user experience right and keep it as simple as the rest of the website is just is mind-bogglingly difficult. Um, so, um, so I'm not going to, you know, the, there's a huge, huge piece of work there in, in understanding how you even could bring it in. Um, but yeah, that, there, are, there are some very bright minds working on that at the moment. So just wondering, do you want to? So I just wanted to uh, really quickly say that um, so I'm 
part of my life is spent uh, in a sort of startup environment at the, an American observatory that was founded by someone who worked at Google. And part of my life is spent at the university, which is very much like the civil service. Um, and um, what um, me and a few other people, uh, like Lindsay Martin, and possibly have tried to do is bring that type of startup attitude to the yeah. academic environment. Yeah. Um, and there is hope. It does seem to work. Uh, mm. There is a generation of people who are receptive to that way of working. Yeah. And some of my colleagues uh, in the School of Physics now run agile type meetings, stand up meetings with yeah. their research groups. Instead of having the typical, I will spend an hour with each research student, they'll spend uh, an hour with all the research students in a stand up meeting and then split those off into uh, meetings about particular topics. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, maybe. Service, but there are ways that it will work in, mm. uh, in universities and academia, and actually it works really, really well for, for research yep. in that way. There's, um, there's something I picked up on recently. Apparently, the guy who invented the waterfall methodology, so this is the idea of planning everything up front, um, apparently somebody forgot to read to the end. Now, I don't know if this is true, but it, it seems to be relatively well sourced. So that somebody had written this article saying, you know, I've invented this model, which I call the grandiose model of planning, and it's a bad idea, and here's how you should do it. And, and all the IBMs of the world just stopped at, OK, that's how we'll do things. The next. So in a sort of kind of hitchhiker's guide style catastrophe, the way the world has run its projects has been based on just not reading the ending. Um, and if that's true, I would love to throttle someone because I've lived through those projects and they're not a good idea. Um, so yeah, I think you know the, there are people who just really get it. So you, I think you'll find that um, kind of at the director level, um, people will get it, but they won't fully understand it. They'll see that there's something good there. They'll kind of go, yeah, we should do this thing. Great. But they don't necessarily understand. So I'm, I'm a big believer in kind of self-organizing teams and, and kind of you know, getting rid of top-down control and, and thinking, you know, how do you have an effective organization that works and delivers results, but that isn't telling people what to do? Um, I love the idea that the only two top-down economies in the world are Cuba and North Korea. You would want to be them. So you know, most economies are self-organizing. And you know, so it, it's clearly a, the internet is self-organizing. So when you, you know, as you scale up, as you do bigger things, you have to become self-organizing because, come on, you know, the center won't hold. Um, kind of lost my train of thought. But I think the, the, the kind of director level gets it. The, the sort of people coming in at, at the bottom are like, well, yeah, why wouldn't you? This is obvious, right? And you know, never having lived through the terrors of the past. Um, and, and so I kind of, I guess that you know the culture changes. It, you know, it's the people in the middle, the people who've kind of half lived through it, who've seen the new world coming, and it's just a bit like, oh man, what, you know, what are we going to have to do now? But, um, but yeah, it is just so effective. It works so much better. Um, you know, I kind of often think it. You know, it's a conceit to imagine that you can imagine, um, see into the future. Why would you plan five years ahead? None of us know what's going to happen in five years ahead. So, plan for the horizon you can see. Set your direction. But plan, walk forward, look a little further, plan again. It's just natural. It makes sense. Um, so really pleased if it takes hold in, in academia as well. Sorry, bit of a ramble. <laughs> right,